Hey everybody, this is Charles for Premier Guitar, and it's a thrill to be uh, here at the Rickenbacker factory in Santa Ana, California. Rickenbacker, which is one of the pillars of electric guitar history and American electric guitar history, is celebrating their 80th anniversary this year, and we're going to go inside. We're going to visit Rickenbacker chairman, CEO, John Hall, and uh, take a peek into their own history and how they do things. So let's go inside. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Rickenbacker chairman, CEO, John Hall. John, how are you doing? I'm doing good. We're real happy to have you here. Thanks very much. John's going to take us inside and we're going to see how they do things here. What are we going to go see first? I think we'll start in the wood shop and then we'll move all the way through the factory. Well, unfortunately, this isn't very impressive because we're late enough in the day that we've already cut up most of our wood. But we bring in large lifts of uh, primarily maple and uh, cut it all up as early in the day as we can, get it into a guitar the same day. You told me earlier what percentage, approximately, of, of wood that you bring in is maple, and what was that again? Oh, I wouldn't be surprised if it isn't uh, 85, 90 percent. Uh, that's our primary wood. We believe that it's the perfect wood for making a guitar very stable, it finishes well, and uh, most importantly, it's plantation or farm grown. It's not an endangered species. It's something that uh, uh, can be replaced within about 10 years uh, in a farm environment. It's called a jump saw. As we're going to see in a second, it uh, almost completely hides access to the blade. Now what, what are we cutting up here? Uh, we're cutting up neck blanks here. We're just cutting off the ends, cutting them to the proper length. It comes down and it protects the blade. You don't even see it. It holds the piece and it cuts it off. Very cool. You really have to work hard to hurt yourself with this one. We start with a rectangular piece. It's just two pieces of wood left and right, and one half came out of the same board uh, immediately next to it and was just cut, flipped over, and glued together. Then it goes onto a CNC machine and it's carved out fully from the inside first. Now, this is something you do very, very differently. This is a, than, than almost any guitar manufacturer. This is something that's very quintessentially Rickenbacker in some way. Well, it's building a guitar from the inside out, actually. Now that we take that, we'll take a, uh, a back, we'll laminate a back onto it, uh, as this one, and we'll, we'll, we'll allow it to dry. And then, this will go onto the CNC machine as a unit. We'll cut the shape on the exterior, and all of the interior will still remain open like that with all of its uh, tone chambers. And we're going to do all of the little fine cuts to the top of the instrument. So we'll get some pickup cutouts and uh, all of the various little uh, details like the sound hole. Rather than create entirely new models, we were trying to transfer the manual production of older instruments to the CNC. So our procedure was really quite straightforward. We went and we found what you would call the quintessential version of that model. The instrument that sounded the best, that played the best, looked the best. Created a 3D digital model of that instrument. And we keep making that instrument over and over. The code that the machine executes is based off of that that 3D model. So there's a lot more capability that we have here with CNC, and I think that's why we made the move. It's capability, repeatability, not necessarily increased production, although that is a side benefit. After coming off the CNC machine, uh, this, in this begins to be a completed looking instrument. It it's a solid, uh, a well responding uh, piece of wood, it's still got all of its tone chambers inside, all of the different cutouts necessary to pass through the wiring. Uh, it's finally beginning to look like a guitar. Obviously it's going in, we're a little more sanding here. This is a 360, so as compared to that 330, it's had two additional operations. One, the edge has been shaped into that nicely contoured edge. It's also had a uh, binding applied on the back, the binding slot was cut and then that was hand applied. Creates a nice uh, looking appearance on the back of the instrument. 
We have several different ways to make necks. Uh, this is the slower ball cutter method where essentially we're taking a ball nose router and moving it across the wood, just incrementally moving it each time so that we can get that shape. We have other programs too though that have special cutters that can take off the uh, wood and make the shape of the neck in one pass. But uh, there's pros and cons of both. Typically high production units will use the specialized one pass cutter. Lower production will use the ball cutter. But it's also uh, dependent upon uh, the, the geometry involved. Uh, these are 330 necks, uh, which is a, uh, a glued in insert type neck. So we've got a, a complete wood assembly here. Uh, this is laminated with the retified maple down the middle and uh, two laminations on the headstock. This will be inserted into a body a little later in the process. Our scheduling is such that at any given time in the shop, we're, we're doing one family of instrument. Uh, that might be for an entire week. Uh, it could be several weeks straight actually. But um, it's much more efficient for us if we're making instruments that are all roughly related. This would be the final product off of the CNC machine, a, a fully completed neck structure ready for sanding. Doesn't have a fingerboard yet on it, but um, you can see the alignment pin holes, which make sure that it lines up perfectly on the CNC machine every time. We've got the retified maple on the headstock and the stringer. So it's an all maple structure, even though it has the uh, difference in color, it, it's all the same type of maple. All of our instruments have dual truss rods. The truss rod slot has already been put in here. Uh, the, uh, the rod enters through the top and will be adjusted at the head, but it's a little hard to see, but there's two maple grooves all the way through here and this is done in a bit of an arc and the trim strips that are on the top have been inserted and glued in and then trimmed flush. So we have a channel all the way down the length of the instrument and uh, the other end of the truss rod will be uh, fixed down here. It's perfectly possible on a Rickenbacker to unscrew the nuts and slide the rod out so if you want to replace the rod down the road you don't have to take the fingerboard off. It's a pretty easy, easy job to service it. So this is Ben Hall, this is John's son, and uh, Ben is actually the factory manager, is that correct? And uh, you're overseeing all the various processes here. Uh, you also seem to be tackling one yourself here. What's this all about? At this table, what we do is we actually assemble the rod, uh, these pairs right here, and we wrap them in shrink tube. And we will take them over here and we will use a heat gun And this shrinks it just enough so that it fits into the truss rod channels of our guitars. And obviously this is a very important process. Uh, we don't want it loose, we want it rattling around. And this will ensure a snug fit and uh, ensure that we have uh, optimal adjustability in the guitars as well. We put the truss rods in as soon as they're finished in the wood shop department. So they need to be inside the guitar before it goes into the finish area because otherwise we have to put the truss rods in up here, which we used to do for years, but felt that wasn't really the best place to do it. So we do it before there's any paint even on the guitar. I think the shape of headstocks, shape of the neck, all of those things is a little bit like ladies' fashion. It changes from year to year. But yeah, we have gone back to some of the styles that people seem to prefer. But I have no doubt in a few years down the road, everyone will say they preferred the larger headstocks and we'll go back to that. The fingerboard process is pretty straightforward. We create a, a fingerboard blank here, in this case, uh, Bubinga, and uh, it goes on the CNC machine, and the CNC machine transforms that blank into something a little more sophisticated like this. It's uh, got some cutouts, and uh, it does have some locating pins on the back so that we know exactly where everything is located on the machine. From that stage we add inlays 
Uh, the inlays are nothing more than a piece of plastic that's inserted into the slot. It's, it's glued in place and it goes back on the machine. The machine trims the edge slot, which is where the binding is going to go, but it also prepares the crowning of the, of the fingerboard. It does that all in one pass and it, it contours the entire fingerboard to the proper shape. I see we have two kinds of wood here actually. We have uh, uh, Caribbean rosewood as well as one piece of bubinga. This is probably a straggler from, from something. But um, we're tending to use the Caribbean rosewood more and more because we like the uniformity, the difference in grain. And it's a little brown, more brown rather than uh, reddish in appearance. As you can see, this is the very high-tech method of uh, creating fret dots here. Essentially, it's just a little rod that's inserted and trimmed. Uh, that'll get trimmed off by the CNC machine. How often does he change blocks of wood to use as a hammer? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I'm sure there's some special mojo associated with that particular block. This is actually just a r relatively simple, easy way to make sure that the glue is applied evenly, that it's dispensed over the surface of the of the wood properly. We don't use too much or too little this way. Here he's laminating fingerboards to the necks. There's actually a, a little dimple in the neck and a corresponding a mating uh, hole in the fingerboard so that the fingerboard is always going to line up with the neck exactly the way the the model and the CNC machine predicted that they would. So the left and right halves of the body are joined to the neck over here. It's just a simple matter of, of, of gluing it together and letting the glue dry. Uses very basic aliphatic resin glue, no, uh, no magic here. And um, it really makes for a great instrument because all of the tension is really contained on that center piece of wood. It's not spanning a neck joint. It's, uh, it's all, all of the tone, everything remains right there in the center in that solid piece of wood. And it's a technique that we've been using forever. Obviously, if you were to break a neck... It's a big problem. It would be a, a big problem. It, it, I suppose in that circumstance, it'd be nice to bolt on a neck. And I have to say, in production, it would probably be nicer to be able to deal with bodies and necks separately. But this is just simply a better way to, to, to make an instrument, in my opinion. Over in the uh, main part of the wood shop, we saw tons and tons of 330 guitars. But here, in the next shop over, we're uh, seeing 4,003 instruments, and that's simply because today is Monday. They started making 330s in the wood shop. This would be Friday's instruments, and uh, obviously we were making 4,003 basses then. But at this stage forward, everything is by hand. A lot of automation in the rough, rough mill over there, but uh, from this point on, it's all basic down and dirty handwork. He's just doing some uh, cleanup of the binding where it meets the frets. A little bit of hand work necessary to make that look right. In this area, we're providing all of the coatings on the instrument. It starts out with a number of sealer coats. And then if it's a shaded type finish, uh, it's applied by hand to get the, the, the coloring that uh, in the fire glow shading or any burst type shading. Our materials now are almost completely solvent free and they'll never dry as such, but they contain a photo initiator and after the instrument is sprayed here, we put it into an oven, which is a misnomer because there's really no heat involved, and expose the thing to ultraviolet light. The ultraviolet light sets off the photo initiator and cures the finish very similar to the way dentists do bonding in, uh, in your mouth anymore. Doing it this way is not only great for production because it's a huge time saver, it's also a tremendous uh, ecological step forward because 
that solvent is now not going up the stack and into the atmosphere. We're containing almost all of the materials here and reusing them. So the instrument spins around three minutes and 45 seconds, that's going to come out cured. But we intentionally don't mask it all off. And the reason for that is it allows us to come back quite literally to create a razor edge line between the color and the, uh, the binding. And they take the razor blade and uh, with a great deal of uh, practice and skill on this, are able to create that, that perfectly sharp delineation between the, the color of the instrument and the binding. Has that been going on the same way? You've been doing that the same way for all these years? Uh, that's been that way since we began putting on binding, which um, must have been in the 50s sometime. We use a lot of automation here where we can, but there's just some things like this that really can't be done any other way than with a lot of skill and by hand. In order to achieve the absolutely perfectly smooth finish that we need, we go through a number of uh, levels of sanding where we're uh, continuously getting down to finer and finer sandpapers. This is just basically leveling the finish. There's a certain inconsistency when you spray to the finish and this levels that all out nice and smooth. But it ends up with this nice milky looking color immediately before it goes into the buffing stage which then polishes that all off into a gloss. This is actually one of the most difficult jobs in the shop. It takes an immense amount of skill to buff the instruments properly. We spend about an hour and a half with each instrument. Well, it varies a little bit by model. And we're using differing types of compounds. Start with something that's fairly abrasive. We work down through the system until it's pure wax. And it's the way to achieve a really deep looking finish that, that we're known for. You mentioned there's a lot of experience in this room. Uh, there is. We currently have a father and son working in this room. And uh, we previously also had the grandfather. So it's something that's been handed down. Here we've got a instrument with a exceptionally glossy, deep looking finish. And uh, it's, it's something that's achieved not so much with materials as with uh, lots of knowledge and uh, time. The biggest investment in the finish is the time that it takes. Uh, again, all completely done by, by hand at this point. And I, I don't think there's too many people that can compare with us on the quality of finish that we're putting out consistently every day of the week. An awful lot of the circuitry that you find in other guitars is produced in Asia, wired as assemblies and imported into the U.S. for inclusion in guitars. We do it all here. It's very important to us that we utilize American components where we can. Switchcraft connectors out of Chicago. It's the CTS pots, some of which are produced in uh, Taiwan, but uh, it's all custom-made components for us. But we believe in, in doing as much as we possibly can here in the U.S. with U.S.-made products. Jeff Rhodes here, his dad is Red Rhodes, amplifier modification fame, and, uh, and he's known for pretty famous uh, pickups, the Velvet Hammer pickups. It's pretty amazing to me that such a fine piece of wire can be wound at such a speed and that, of course, is something that the computer can do. It's modulating the tension throughout the cycle here. We believe it's really important to, to have the high accuracy on the winding of the pickups. Of course, the unique thing is, is that we're doing it again here in the U.S. Uh, almost all of this type of work is done either in uh, Asia or Mexico currently by others. Here we begin the final assembly of the instrument. Key winds, pickups, pick guards, all of the different parts come together here. These are all uh, 
the exception of the German-made Schaller key wines, all parts that uh, we make here in the U.S. We also go to a great deal of trouble to color match the chrome. Some parts are brass, some are die-cast zinc, some are steel. We vary the nickel chrome content so that they all are the same color of chrome. And we match them against the Schaller chrome that's done in Germany. This is the final detailing of the instrument. Getting ready to uh, prepare this for shipment. She's just making sure that all the fingerprints and polish and dust on the instrument are cleaned up here. She's also inspecting it for any little imperfections and there might be a little touch-up work occasionally that needs to be done. And this is the stage where, where we want to catch that. What's going on here? Just putting the nameplate on, yeah. finishing up. Fancy business. Yep. Worthy enough to be a Rickenbacker. So we're looking at the finished product, John. Yeah, this is one of uh, today's uh, production going out. All of these instruments will be shipped tomorrow. And uh, interestingly, about 60% of everything we produce goes outside the U.S. Pretty high percentage of, of export. I like this one. I'm a bass player, so I think this one's going to be a good one. Thanks a lot for showing us around, John. I appreciate it. Our pleasure. This is Charles for Premier Guitar.